fog's just lifting. They're off your bow line. They're off your stern. Blow your air horn and throw a wave to the lighthouse keeper as you leave the dock. Guys are busy. You're in charge. You know what? You're a captain. Can't be good unless you love it. Waves are crashing. The sound of thunder is booming. You scan the horizon, searching for any sort of relief. But you see no hope before you. Your only choice is to drop to your knees and cry out for supernatural guidance. Welcome. Thank you so much. Great to have you here today. I want to say hello to all of our campuses real quick. Thanks so much for being a part of our services. I want to say a special thanks to Pastor Steve last week for preaching for me, too. He does such a great job. He's a phenomenal communicator. So blessed to have him. One of these days, you're just going to say, Bill, just don't show up anymore. We got Steve. We're good. I'm telling you, that guy is talented. He's amazing. I'm very thankful for him and the impact he's having on our students. And so, so grateful for him. Well, we're tar- starting a brand new series today called Boat Stories. So many of the greatest miracles and stories and teachings of Jesus in the Bible are around boats. They were either on a boat, near a boat, near the shore, out the shore. I mean, it just there's so many boat stories in the Bible. So I thought, let's just take a look at those and compile them and share about those for the next few weeks. So I'm very excited about this brand new series called Boat Stories. Real quick, I have to say before I get started too, I had an amazing time this last week going to the McConnell unit out to our God Behind Bars campus out there. It was phenomenal. Let's give it up for all of our God Behind Bars campuses. We love you guys. It was awesome spending time with you. Wow. Truly amazing. One of my favorite stories is of a captain uh, that was out to sea with his crew, and uh, his ensign from the very top deck looking out uh, at the lookout said, Captain, Captain, we're being attacked by a pirate ship. And so there was an attack coming, and so he said, Quick, give him a red shirt. He puts on his red shirt, and the attacking party comes, and they fight, and they eventually win. About an hour after this, they're kind of resting, and, and uh, he changes back out of that shirt. And, and, and as he's sitting there with his men, the ensign says, Captain, Captain, two ships are coming to attack us. He says, quick, give me my red shirt. Puts his red shirt on. They fight. This time it's a much more tough, ba- it's a tougher battle. They barely make it. There's a few injuries, but they're okay. And so they finally, they, they, they stave off the other attack, and they're, they're sitting there in the boat now resting, just kind of, whew, worn out and tired. And finally one of the men said, Captain, Why is it that every time we're attacked, you always ask for your red shirt? He goes, well, that's easy. You see, if I get attacked and if I'm somehow bleeding or injured, you won't be able to tell. And they're like, oh, that's brilliant. That makes perfect sense. He goes, see, that way you won't lose heart. You won't lose your confidence. You'll keep fighting. Well, the next morning, all of a sudden, uh, the ensign, bright early in the morning, jumps up and says, Captain, Captain, we're being attacked again by pirates. He says, how many ships? He goes, 10 ships this time. Captain stops and says, bring me my brown pants. So, I don't know how bad the attack you're facing is. It may require brown pants. I'm not going to explain that, by the way, if you don't understand. But the reality is that we all get attacked. We go through difficulties. We go through problems. And maybe your boat is being rocked. What do you do when your boat's getting rocked? What do you do when you find yourself in the middle of a terrible storm and you just don't know what to do? What to do when you don't know what? To do. Let's look at some scripture today. Look at Matthew chapter 8 with me. This is a great story about Jesus in the boat with his disciples. It says this in Matthew chapter 8, starting in verse 23. Then Jesus got into the boat and started across the lake with his disciples. Suddenly, please underline that. That's the thing about storms. They're really not a problem if you know way in advance, but most storms you don't. I mean, a real storm, a real battle in your life is a surprise. It, it took you by surprise. You weren't planning on it. You didn't know you're going to wake up one day and your spouse says, I'm done with you. I'm leaving you. I don't, I'm not in love anymore. You didn't know one day your son's going to come home or your daughter's going to come home and say, I've been doing weed. You didn't know that you're going to come to work one day and not have a job. You didn't realize that you were going to be in a crisis. It's, it's a suddenly, right? So suddenly, a fierce storm struck the lake with waves breaking into the boat. Now, before we go any further on, on, on how to deal with a storm, the first thing you have to get over is the shock that you're in one. Because if you don't get over the shock, if you don't get over the offense you have with God that you're in the middle of a storm, you won't be able to deal with it. A lot of people say, God, this isn't fair. This isn't right. Why is this happening to me? And we shake our fists to God and say, Lord, how would you let this happen? Why, God, why? 
But if you get stuck in the why, you never get to the what to do. So you got to get past the why so you can get to the what. And so I found in my life, most of the time, instead of focusing on the why, I have to say who, who am I here to minister to, who am I supposed to make a difference in your life, and then what am I supposed to do? Or I can focus on the whys. Whys will stop you in life. you got to move past the why. You know, there's a huge storm that just hit us in Texas. And good people, some of them from South Texas, good, honest, loving, Christian people, some of them lost their lives. And if you're like me, you're thinking, why? Why would that happen? I mean, I mean, God, what could your purpose possibly be in the middle of that? I mean, Lord, what, what could be the reason for that? And i got to be honest with you. I don't know why. But I can either get stuck on the why or I can focus on the what. God, what am I supposed to do from here on out? I can get stuck on the why someone left me or I can focus on the what am I supposed to do now and who is still with me. I should be encouraging them and loving them and pouring into them. What are you going to focus on, the why or the what? I want to encourage you that the truth is, is that it's tragic what happens to us at times and to other people. And when you see some storms like this that hit and not everyone makes it, you think that's just tragic. God, I thought you were there. Who said he wasn't? He was there. In fact, if you just look from this side of eternity, it looks tragic. But if you recognize the other side of eternity, they're doing just fine. They're doing better than ever. And I'm not trying to say that we don't struggle with the why for those of us who are left behind, thinking, God, I, I miss my loved one. I miss the person I care about. And and I'm not trying to say that's easy. I don't, I don't mean to blow that off. But understand, they're not hurting anymore. They're doing great. So we have to look at it from a perspective of eternity. So there are times when the Lord causes things to, to, to happen and to go our way. Now, God doesn't cause evil, but he will allow sometimes, he'll lift his hand sometimes and let stuff happen to us. He doesn't cause it, but we live in an evil world. The most painful gift God ever gave this world was free choice, because when you brought free choice, you brought everything else. You say, what does it have to do with storms? Everything. Did you notice how the weather was perfectly acclimated until sin entered the world? Did you know it even affects things like that? So the truth is, is that, is that really for us to understand evil, we have to understand that choices were made early on in humanity that brought evil into this world. It, it happens. And so storms are going to come in your life. That is a reality. Instead of focusing on the why, let's focus on the what. What do we do about it from here? It's the reality principle. Okay, we're in a storm. We're here. There's no getting out of it now. What do we do? So we've got to focus on the reality of today. What do we do in the middle of our storm? And by the way, I just want to mention godly people have lost their lives, and it wasn't fair. John the Baptist served Jesus his entire life, dies in prison, and you think, oh, maybe he's going to get out at the end. Well, he gets out, but he gets out because they behead him. I mean, is that fair? Not on this side of eternity, but on the other side of eternity, I bet he's doing pretty good. So you got to understand, we're rewarded in the afterlife for what we go through, what we do. Did you know that? How about Job? Some people say, oh, I don't want to be Job, man. I, I feel like I'm Job. I, I got this horrible life. If you really were Job, I'd say, lucky you. Because he got double for his trouble. Double the family. Double the money. He was already the richest guy around. Now he's double that. Double the blessings. Double the happiness. He said, though you slay me, I will, I will bless you, God. In other words, he never focused on his, himself. He never threw himself a pity party in the middle of his boat being rocked, in the middle of his world being rocked, turned upside down. He didn't do that, right? Actually, when he did do it, excuse me, when he did park in it, he didn't get any answers. But when he, the, you know when everything turned around for Job? The moment he prayed for his friends. When he got his eyes off himself and on other people. All of a sudden, God said, and now I will bless you again. Bam, all the blessings come in his life again when he got his eyes off himself. You can focus on the why, you can focus on the who and the what. Job focused on the what. Lord, what do you have for me? And the who. Who am I supposed to bless? I'm going to pray for my friends. So I want to challenge you as we start this message that tragedies do happen. Bad things do happen to good people that love God, that honor God. And until you understand that, you're going to be really frustrated because oftentimes we think we made some kind of unwritten deal with God that like if I'm going to love you and serve you and go to church and tithe and be a blessing to you, that everything will go good in my life. The problem with that is I just don't find that anywhere in here. There is no promise of no hard times. There is a promise that he will be with you in the boat. He will help you get through the storm. He doesn't say he'll take all storms away. So the first thing I want you to write down, number one, is this. Storms hit no matter how close you are to Jesus. Storms hit no matter how close you are to Jesus. And I'm not trying to blow this off. I realize the incredible pain that you may feel like I'm traipsing through right now. I'm not trying to do that. 
I don't want someone traipsing through my pain either. But if I don't walk through my pain, I'll live and wallow in it. So at some point, you may say, I'm in my darkest day, pastor. You know the greatest thing about your darkest day? It's only 24 hours. You can walk through it. The good thing about pastoring in the same church for a very long time is I look around this room and I see people that have helped you walk through some of your darkest days. And you know what? I've been proud of you to watch you go through it and to get up and to keep moving and to see God's purpose in it eventually. Not initially, but eventually. God has a purpose in everything. Even when it doesn't make sense on this side of eternity, God has a plan and we all have to know that. And so you just have to learn to trust God. And so then Jesus got up uh, uh, into the boat, started across the lake, bam, suddenly a storm hits. So apparently Jesus knew this was coming. And so he, now think about this. If he knows everything, he knows the future. And he, he intentionally got into a boat with his disciples when he, know a storm, he knew a storm was coming. He must have purpose in the storm because he knew it was coming. So the good news for you is that no matter how close you are, Jesus, storms come your way, but, but he's with you. He's in the boat with you. you. You can be encouraged in that. And by the way, I just want to say this too. If your boat is never rocking in your life ever, it's because you're never leaving shore. So the truth is, is that you should experience some rocking in your boat because that means you're going somewhere. The only people who never have a boat rocking are people who never go anywhere. God gave you a life to live. He gave you talents and abilities to use. He gave you dreams to pursue. Go somewhere with them. Leave the shore. Step out in faith. He wants us to do that. Look what happens next. I, lo I love, this is one of my favorite scriptures because it, it's just something I can relate to so well. Matthew 8, 24. It says, but Jesus was sleeping. <laughs> I love that verse because it's like, what? He was sleeping? It doesn't say Jesus was praying. Jesus was transfiguring like he does with Peter. It doesn't say that. It doesn't say all oh, this holy moment happened. Jesus was napping. You ever felt like Jesus was napping in the middle of your storm? You're like, do you know what's going on in my life right now, Jesus? Are you aware? Are you, did, you, are you, did you take the day off today? Are you sleeping? What's going on? Are you aware of what's happening in my life? You ever felt that way? Let's just be honest in here. Okay, maybe there's some honest Christians over here. Anyone else understand what I'm talking about? Where you're like, are you aware of what's going on? Do you know how bad my finances are? Do you know I can't get my kid to obey me? Do you know my boss is on my tail? Do you realize I'm having fights and fits at work? And do you know these people are mad at me? Do you realize what's going on in my life? You see, I, I love the fact that the disciples are about to talk to Jesus. And I think it's interesting what they say. These are the closest people to him. And the closest people to, the, to him are not people who sound spiritual. Those are the people Jesus scolded and said, you know what? You talk all big spiritual, but your hearts are far from me. I'll be honest with you. When, when someone talks really spiritual to me, I don't trust it. I'm just being honest. I know it sounds really big. You're like, you're a pastor. That sounds horrible. I know. I know I'm being honest with you. I got a little bit of jadedness. I'm going to be honest because the more someone is sappy, spiritual sounding, at some point I say, you know what? This is just a cover up. At some point, this isn't real. No one is always having a flowery, wonderful Sunday school day. I've never met anyone like that. Some people are like, I just wake up in the morning and say, good morning, Lord. I said, no, I wake up and say, good Lord. It's, you know, morning, right? That's what... <laughs> So I don't get that. The people that are like, it's just always spiritual and always wonderful and praise the Lord this and praise the Lord. I'm like, no. The, I love the disciples' prayer because this is how a real prayer goes. This is how it really happens. This is, you want to really walk with Jesus? This is what prayers really sound like. The disciples went and woke him up shouting, Lord, save us. We're going to drown. <laughs> Can anybody relate to that prayer? You're like, I feel so spiritual all of a sudden. I didn't know. I'm so close to God. But here's the truth. You don't really get to dependence on God until you first, the, the, the way to get to dependence avenues, you got to go around panic corner. So you got to go through the panic to get to the dependence. So actually you may be way closer to Jesus than you think. Because to really know the Lord is to know what it is like to be afraid and scared and freaking out and panic and say, I'm going to drown. And Jesus must have woke up and said, really? I wish I could have been there to hear the exact phrase of all he said. You know? Now, I'm not trying to say this is paraphrasing. This is what he said. This is one of the disciples' account, but I'm sure that other people heard different things, right? I mean, I'm not trying to say this is, this is accurate, but I'm sure there were other things said to other disciples while they were there. You know, he must have been like, I'll save you. And looked at Peter and went, wuss. You know, you know that must have happened. I mean, come on. And, you know, if I'm writing the Bible, I wouldn't record it either. Like, what do you say? Oh, he said, uh, I will save you. Do you say anything else? We'll just leave it at that. You know what I mean? You know, <laughs> right? And, but, but, but it says here, 
Suddenly, right, this fierce storm, the disciples went and they woke him up shouting, Lord, save us, we're going to drown. You ever had prayers like that? Prayers without faith? We, we pray prayers like this, God, I'm going to die. My life's falling apart. This is horrible, right? And you know Jesus is like, really? Seriously, like how many years have you been with me now? How many months have we been walking? How many times have I told you you can trust me and you wake me up and tell me you're going to drown? Thanks for letting me know you're going to drown. I'm going to go back to sleep now. <laughs> it's like sometimes I think that we are putting our, our panic prediction and we're putting that to God. Like, let me just tell you what's going to happen, God. I'm going to lose the house. Let me just say what's going to happen, God. I'm going to be single the rest of my life. Let me just say what's going to happen, God. I'm going to lose my job. Let me just say what's going to happen, Lord. All my finances are going to go to the pot. I'm just, let me just say what's going to happen, Lord. Everything's going to fall apart. And you know, the Lord must be going, thanks for letting me in on your plans. <laughs> but now let me let you in on my plans. And so I think it's very important to understand that when we're panicked, we run to Jesus to wake him up. We're like, are you asleep? Will you wake up? But when that happens, number two, please write this down. When waking Jesus, you finally realize he is waking you. You finally get it that you thought, Jesus, are you asleep at the wheel? And he says, no, I'm not. I only seemed asleep to you, so I'd finally get you to wake up. I was talking to a lady that married a friend of mine. Got to know her. Now she's a friend too, through him. But she had lost her first husband very tragically. They just had a baby. I was talking to her about this. I said, man, I mean, you, you're, you're, you have lived a roller coaster life. I said, this is crazy. You, you, you married a good man, you know, great guy. And all of a sudden he dies tragically. Bam, life cut way too short. You just had a baby. Now you find yourself a single mom. You, know, you had a plan here and the plan just was shot right there, like instantly. Wow, immediate devastation. I said, that must have been horrible. Aren't you glad you could rely upon the Lord? I bet you're so glad you had your walk with God at that point in time. And you know, she told me, and I'm so thankful for her honesty. She said, I gotta be honest with you, Pastor. She goes, God did get me through that. But to be honest with you, the first thing I did when I talked to God was, God, I'm sorry. It just took me this long to start talking to you again. Man, I appreciated that authenticity. And she does love the Lord and she does know the Lord. And her her, her new husband now, it's not so new now, but they, they've married quite a while now, but was a godly man. Her former husband that died, good man. But the truth is this, is that she said, you know, honestly, I, I, I came back to God because what choice did I have? I mean, I knew the Lord, but I returned to him because of this incredible tragedy. And, and I appreciate that honesty, because let's be honest in here. Most of us came back to church because something bad happened. Because something hit us and we're like, wow, things are falling apart, right? And, and when that happens, God says, I've been here all along. So you think you're coming to wake me up, but the truth is, is that you could have been depending upon me when times are good rather than just depending upon me when times are, are bad. So the real wake-up call is, is not us waking Jesus. It's Jesus using a storm to wake us. So maybe he's waking you up today. You know, I, I'm starting to figure out why God, as a leader, always gives me more vision than I have money for, than we have people for, than we have resources or facilities. I'm, I'm finally starting to figure out why God always gives me way more vision than I can handle. Because it requires me to go to Him. I'm convinced that the reason why the Lord gives you more than you think you can handle is because you finally realize you can handle it with Him. You're not supposed to handle the storm without Jesus in your boat. The funny thing is we forget that he's there until you need him. But man, when you need him, if your prayer sounds like mine, it's like, God, help me now. That's how my most spiritual prayers sound. God, please. You would think I was cussing his name rather than calling his name. But I'm not. I'm just saying, God, I'm desperate, oh Lord, please, please help me. I'm in a mess. I don't know what to do. I don't know how to get out of this. Jesus says, okay, so you're waking up. You're finally realizing that I've been there all along. I want to quickly interrupt this message with an important announcement. This is a little commercial here. This is the last week to sign up for student camp. And I just want to interrupt this message and say, this is a very big deal. And if you're blowing it off, parent, you don't know what you are missing and what you're taking from your child. You have no idea. I'm not kidding about this. If you have not signed up your student for student camp, and they're between 6th and 12th grade. They just came out of 6th or came out of 12th all the way through. They said, well, they're graduated. They're going to be going to college. No, let's start off with a spiritual foundation. Send them to camp. Well, I tried to get my kid to go to camp, and they won't. You don't try. You just send them. 
But they're going to be mad at me when they're loading on the bus, I know. And they're going to be even more mad when we unload them off the bus from having to leave camp five days later. Because in the middle of all that, their hearts change. Let me tell you why I believe in camp so much. I was saved at camp, and God called me to the ministry at camp. It changed my life. Let me tell you something else about camp you may not realize. If you force your child to go to youth group, which you should, you should, you should tell your, your student, you're going to youth group whether you like it or not, just like you brush your teeth whether you like it or not. Why? For both reasons. We don't want rot. <laughs> right? We don't want teeth rotting and we don't want hearts rotting. If you don't believe they need it, just go grab their iPod. iPod, iPod what's an iPod? That's a new one. <laughs> creating new technology as I speak. This is amazing. <laughs> Grab their iPod or their iPhone and listen to their music and just write down a few of the lyrics for a second and ask the question, is their heart rotting or is it growing? And you will throw your child at camp <laughs> when you realize what the world's offering them. But here's why I love camp. See, if you send your kid to youth group every single week, whether you're at this campus, another campus, wherever you are, and you send them to youth group every week, and they go, let's just say you're really uh, strong on it, you, you come to church every week, and so you miss a few for vacation, a few for holidays, but by and large, you're at church. That means you're getting them, you know, 50, 48 weeks a year, right? At least you're getting them. So they're getting 48 over one year period of time, hours of time with God in, in the youth group, right? They get that in the first two days of camp. It's called Turbo God. <laughs> Nonstop. In your face. Worship. Bible study. Group. Lessons. Crazy games. A blast. A little flirting in the middle of all that. All this is going on. <laughs> all this is going on at camp the whole time. I'm not going to ask my boys which one they like out of the most out of that list. I probably won't like the answer. But here's the deal. The truth is if you send your kid to camp, they will be changed. Don't miss camp. Make them go. Well, they don't want to go alone. Then you know what? Bring a friend. Have them bring their friend. They can bunk up. That's fine. As long as they're the same sex. Anyways, <laughs> just a little clarification, I'm just saying. Have your kid go to camp. Today's the deadline. Don't pray about it. You're too late to pray. Today's the deadline. Just sign them up. Just do it, okay? I can promise you pray about it. Lord, do you want my kid to go to camp? God's like, they go, no, of course not. Of course he wants your kid to go to camp because it changed their life. Can we give it up for our student ministry real quick? Let's sign them up today. Sign them up. Look what happens next. Jesus responded. I love that. Please underline that because isn't it good to know that Jesus will respond? So even when you pray a bad doomsday prayer like, we're going to die, which is what they pray, Jesus still responds. Isn't that good to know? He is a first responder. And when your building is burning, when your boat is rocking, they're gonna, he's going to come rescue you. Isn't it good to know that he is there for you. Jesus responded, why are you afraid? You have so little faith. Then he got up and rebuked the wind and waves, and suddenly there was a great calm. This is crazy. There are waves. There is a wind. It is, the, the water is breaking over the boat. I mean, this is some crazy stuff. And while all this is going on, they're panicked. Jesus, wake up. We're going to drown. And he goes, you guys have so little faith. How many times have I talked to you about this? Right? He goes, I got this. And he walks out onto the platform of the boat. And he says, and by the way, you know what they call this? You know what this boating platform is technically called, by the way, on boats? It's called the pulpit. That's interesting. So he walks out onto the pulpit and he doesn't preach to the guys that are freaking out. He preaches to the actual storm. He says, calm down. And like a movie scene, it just goes crazy to calm. Now, you know those guys are freaking out. They were like, do that again. You know they were freaking out. Like, that was unbelievable. Are you kidding me? You took it from craziness to calm in a second. The wind and the waves have to obey him. What is this teaching you and me? Number three, speak faith to your storm. Speak faith to your storm. Guys, don't speak, to your, don't speak about your problems. Speak to your problems. In fact, can I just encourage you? If you've got a big problem in your life, are you walking around telling everyone about it? You are a walking billboard for lack of faith if you are. Keep your problem between you and God and those it involves. So Matthew 18 actually teaches, by the way, to go directly to the person instead of to everyone else, right? And so go to God directly, then talk to the person directly if it involves people, and that's it. And everyone else should just see a smile on your face. It's all good. God's with me. We're going to be okay. 
The reality is that many times we're speaking about our problems rather than speaking to our problems. But here's the real, here's the real trick. Here, here's what Jesus teaches us here. If you can't, write this down. Somewhere in your notes, this is not one of the fill in the blanks. So just write this down, would you? If you can't speak, if you can't sleep through it, you can't speak to it. If you can't sleep through it, you can't speak to it. Now, I want to talk to the leader in you. I didn't say the leaders in the room because everyone always tunes out, oh, that's someone else. No, if you have anyone following you at all, you're a leader. No, I don't have anybody. Yes, you do. Someone looks up to you. Someone looks at you. And listen, and if you're aspiring to be a leader, if you say, God, make me a great leader, God says, awesome, I'm going to invite a storm into your life, and you just stay calm while everyone else freaks out, and you'll be seen as a leader. The leader's the one who stays calm when everyone's panicked. They're the one who becomes a leader. You know who gets promoted in war? The person who's not freaking out. The person who's like, all right, chill out. We got this. We're going to be okay. They're shooting at us. We know that. Someone got hurt. Someone got injured. We lost someone. We're going to be all right, guys. Here's the plan. And everyone looks at them and goes, who in the world is that? If you can stay calm while everyone else panics, you are increasing your leadership. And so the, the bottom line is this. If you want to become a leader, speak to your storm. Here's how, here's how you speak to your storm. Would you write this down somewhere in your notes? I just want to give you something that I personally do all the time in my life. This is a regular thing. I learned this years ago, over a decade ago, and I have repeatedly applied this to my problems, to this organization's problems, to overcome things. Here it is. This is what I do. I get a sheet of paper and I write out two or three scriptures of faith at the very top. That means I apply faith. And I put those verses on the top. For me, it's Ephesians 3.20. God can do immeasurably more than we could ever think or even imagine according to the power that works through Christ within us. And so I put that verse at the top. Then I'll put, you know, Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ. And I put other relevant verses dealing with what I'm dealing with, right? And I put those at the top of the paper. And after that, I write 1 through 30 on one sheet or possibly more than one sheet. And then as fast as I can, I, take the, I write the problem below those verses. Never put the problem above the verses. Put your promise above your problem. So I put the promise to God, then I write the problem down. Here's the problem. I need money for this. I got this problem. This person's mad at me. I can't get this person to get along with that person. I got this ministry issue. I don't know how to deal with that. I got a problem with Junior. I got a problem with my daughter. I got a problem. Whatever it is. I don't know what your problem is you're dealing with. I'm just listing off different things that may apply. What about your problem? My boss is uh, you know, out to get me. You know, I, I just lost my job. Whatever the problem is, no matter how big or small, write it out. Then write 1 through 30 below that. And as fast as you can, and with prayer, First of all, you say, God, speak to me now. Holy Spirit, I, I know that you give all good things. And so I ask you right now to flow great ideas through my mind onto this page. And as fast as I can, I write out 30 ideas. You may say, Pastor, I can't think of 30 ideas. Then you haven't thought long enough. Stay seated till God gives you 30, not 10. 10 is easy. 10 is the fun stuff. 10 is like, oh, I got a money problem. Win the lotto. Next. <laughs> my great grandpa dies, leaves me everything. Next. And you get to the, through the unrealistic, stupid things that we all want, right? And then you get to some real answers and keep writing, keep writing. When you get to about 10, you're like, ah, it's getting hard. Keep going. Keep going. Oh, man, I'm like at 15 or 20. It's really, I mean, I mean, I'm having to really stretch and think really creatively. Uh-huh, that's why we're going to 30. Keep going. Keep going until you get to 30 ideas. Then circle back on three of them. Which one's like, you know, that actually makes sense. That's doable. That one's, yeah, maybe, okay. And this one, yeah, that's... Then circle in on one and start on it that day. What does that mean? How do you speak to your problems? You speak a solution to your problem. Wind, calm down. Storm, go away. Waves, relax. You speak a direct solution to the problem. How do you do that? You apply faith, you apply prayer, and you apply a solution immediately. Can I tell you something else I've learned about boating? I don't know that much about it. I'm trying to learn, but let me tell you something else I've learned about boating. Boats do far better against waves if they're going somewhere. The boat that gets rocked is a boat that was sitting still at the beginning of the storm. But if you have a plan and you're going somewhere, did you know you can actually get going so fast that you literally skip right over the top of that storm? All you need is momentum. How do you get momentum? A plan. Get a plan. Work your plan. Well, I just need the Lord just to do this for me. God says he's going to do it. Ephesians 3.20. He can do measuring more than we ever ask or imagine within us. Which means that he wants to use you in the process. Oh, Lord, I need to get out of debt. Can someone just pay off my debt? Why? You wouldn't learn anything. He's going to instead use you to save money and to make more money and to pay down your debts with discipline. So that that way, when you get more money down the road, you know what to do with it. 
Oh, Lord, I just need you to improve my marriage, so I'll just divorce this girl or this guy and get someone new. But the old you will go with you to the new relationship and mess up that one. So he's going to change you within because you, you don't need a new wife. You'll have a new wife. You won't need a new husband. You'll have a new husband when you become renewed. The Bible says he renews us daily. Now I'm way off task. We're just going. We're just preaching now. He wants to renew you daily. He wants to make you new. And when he changes you, it changes everything. But he wants to change you from within. You're the product he's concerned about. The storm is not, listen, you're not supposed to be tossed around by the storm. The storm is supposed to shape you into who you're supposed to become. That's why he, he introduced the storm into your life. Speak faith to your storm. Martin Luther said this, every man must do two things alone. He must do his own dying and he must do his own believing. No one can believe for you. You have to choose faith on your own. You gotta make the decision to follow the Lord. Matthew 8, 27 says this, but the disciples were amazed. I'm sure they were. They were amazed. Who is this man, they asked. Even the winds and the waves obey him. They're like, this is crazy. Did you just see that, John? Yeah, I did, Peter. He got up on the bow and he literally just spoke to the weather and it obeyed him. He told the wind as if he knows the wind. He told the waves as if he knows the waves to calm down. Well, of course he knows. He's Alpha and Omega. The beginning and end, he was there when he put the waves in place and the wind in place. He does know them. And so he's like, uh-uh, calm down now. Take a chill pill, the whole place. Pfft. Calm immediately. So if it got that calm that fast, then why did Jesus let it get that bad? I mean, couldn't he just spoke the calm over the water before he went out? Couldn't you say, well, I'm going to take a nap, so I need you guys to chill. All right, don't be doing anything. Don't, no funny business while I'm napping. He doesn't do that. He lets it get crazy so he can calm things down. See, we keep saying, oh, God, I want miracles. And God says, well, I've got to put you in a pinch to give you a miracle. I've got to let you walk into a mess if I'm going to clean it up and turn it into a message. I've got to put you in the middle of a test if we're going to turn it into a testimony. You want God to do something great in your life? It's real simple. God says, the way I do great things is I introduce a storm in your life. Oh, God, make me into a godly man. Make me into a godly woman. God says, do you know what you're asking? <laughs> make me into a phenomenal leader. Oh, you don't know what you're asking. How do you develop people? Hard times. Storms. You want to be a great leader in your workplace, but your boss keeps ignoring you? Then the Lord will rock the boat so hard your boss will be desperate enough to actually consider looking at you. Some of you are like, I think I just got insulted, Pastor. I'm sorry. I'm not trying to insult you. I'm just telling you that's how it works. You know, every camp when I was young, and I was 20 years old, speaking and preaching and trying to kind of sort of get my foot in the door as far as ministering and traveling and that kind of stuff, every camp I got, my wife is here in the front row. She can attest to this. Every camp I got was because some big speaker backed out, and they were desperate, so they called me. <laughs> Thank the Lord. They were so desperate that they had to call me. But what was really fun is about half of them, not all of them, about half of them, they'd say, can you come back again? So what began to happen was things got so rocky, the way God opens doors for you is he introduces a storm so bad that people will actually look and say, do you have any answers? Because I don't have any answers. Do you have no Oh, God, I want to become a great leader. God says, great. The way I establish great leadership is through difficulties. We call a certain generation in America the greatest generation, don't we? Why do we call them that? Because our fathers and mothers, or our grandfathers and grandmothers lived through World War II and the Depression. And they were the greatest generation that built this country into what it is. I pray it does not take that again. And unfortunately, I know history. There are cycles. And the truth is this. When greatness happens, God allows a storm. I don't mean to be discouraging. I want to tell you something. There's a storm brewing. If you haven't noticed, and you've got your head in the sand that this world needs great leaders. And I believe God has called you to be a part of this message and this ministry and this church because my job is not to raise up a regular old church, but a generation of leaders to change the world. That's what God is calling us to do. 
You want to be great? Welcome to your storm. Because to know Christ is to share in His sufferings. That's what the Bible says. If you're going to walk with God, you're going to have to learn to go through some storms. Oh, God, I want to be a man of God. I want to be a woman of God. I want to be a great leader. I want to do great things. God says, okay, we can do that, but you need to understand there's a price to pay, and the price is you have to overcome your storms. But God gives you the strength. But guess what? You know what's really cool about disciples? It was easy on them. They just had to trust in Jesus. He does the heavy lifting. We're just supposed to depend upon him. Would you take a moment and bow your heads with me? Every head bowed, every eye closed. Number four, by the way. Oh, I'm sorry. No, look up here. I'm a professional speaker, clearly. Okay, number four. Be confident because everything and everyone around you was put there to help you win. This is a belief I really have. And this may sound crazy to you, but it's based upon God's word. It's based upon the fact that God has designed a life for you and me to live, and he's given us victory. We don't, listen, we're not going for victory. We're coming from victory through Christ, okay? So I really believe this. I believe that everything and everyone around me has been designed and put there to help me win. And if you'll take on that belief too, It'll change your life. You will no longer be discouraged. You'll think when something bad comes in your life, you go, okay, you're setting me up, God. When you have a setback, you realize it's just a setup for a comeback. Whatever you're facing in your life, you'll start to realize, wait a minute, God, that's there for a reason. It's not there to hurt me. Or as, as Joseph said to his brothers, you meant to harm me, but God meant it for good. And so you threw me into prison. You sold me off to Egypt, not realizing that I would become the second in charge of all of Egypt one day. So what was meant to hurt you actually will propel you. Let me go back to the very first scripture. Go, go back to the top of your outline, would you do this? It says, Jesus got into the boat and started across the lake with his disciples. This is very important. Jesus always introduces storms in your life to get you somewhere faster. It's never to stop you. It's to get you somewhere faster. Man, I was doing fine at work and all of a sudden I don't get along with my coworkers and bam, 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 I'm out of the job to get you faster to the one I'm trying to get you at, God says. I mean, I was in this relationship I thought it was going great and all of a sudden I said one wrong thing and then they said one wrong thing and we got in this big fight and all of a sudden, bam, we're broken up to get you faster to where we're supposed to go. So what we think is a setback and is hurting us and keeping us from our future is actually God propelling us forward. Like the time in our church. I'm way off now. I'm just throwing stuff out. I know I gotta, I'm going to land this plane, I promise. I'm going to land this boat. Can you do that? Can you land a boat? I'll never forget the time when one-fourth of our church walked out in about two months, period of time. One-fourth of our church. Rumor had it, Bill was done. He's not a man of God, doesn't love the Lord. He's not honoring God. He's about himself. He just doesn't. It was rumor. It was out. This guy, he's not going to have, he's crazy, he's so arrogant. He thinks this church is going to do big things and, and he's got these crazy numbers and dreams and it's just nuts. And about one-fourth of our church walked out in about two months. Do you know it was about the next three months after that that our church almost doubled in size and we bought our first building and we doubled in size again. We quadrupled in size within a year of that. Thank God for that now. Oh, it hurt. It hurt but I had no idea how much I needed it. God has a plan in the middle of your storm. Now will you bow your heads? Your head bowed, your eyes closed. I want to take a moment in prayer. If today you're saying, God, thank you that you're speaking to me in the middle of my storm and I am going to lean on you and depend upon you. I'm going to turn. I'm going to, I'm going to cross the corner of panic. I'm going to cross panic corner and come to Dependence Avenue. If that's you today, would you lift your hand to God and say, God, I'm depending on you. Now I realize I can trust you in the middle of my storm. This was you all along, God. This is you all along. It's not about them, the person you're fighting. It's about him. It's not about that, the situation you're going through. It's about him. It's about you depending upon the Lord. The Lord already has an answer. Quit panicking. Trust the Lord. Maybe today you're here and you've never received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Jesus proved himself over and over again to be something special, to be God in the form of man. Then he did the ultimate act of love for you and me. He died on the cross to pay the price for all of our sins, all the things that keep us from heaven. Jesus died and rose again. Now he waits for you to individually receive him. You can pray a simple prayer and receive Christ right now. You can pray this prayer with me. You can say, dear Jesus, I realize you died on the cross for me. I realize you paid the price for my sin. I believe that. And I believe you rose again from the grave, proving it, you're God. And now I ask you, I invite you to come into my life. Change me from within. Be my Lord and be my Savior. 
Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Isn't God good? His word is so true.